Okay, one of the relatively good or decent arguments in the atheist arsenal when they are arguing against the existence of God is the hiddenness of God. The idea being, if there is in fact a God and he wants to enter in a loving relationship with me, where is he? You say that he does, and you say he's omnipotent and, om and omniscient, well, why don't I know him? Why doesn't he make himself available to me? Why doesn't he present himself in a way where if he's in fact omniscient, he'll know exactly what he needs to do to make me believe? So why does he show up in my bedroom tonight and then, you know, solve the issue, solve the problem? For starters, let's just say that perhaps the atheists are telling the truth in terms of God has remained hidden from them. Let's just say for argument's sake that I am telling you the truth and that there is in fact a God and he is omniscient and omnibenevolent. Then he has in fact to some degree remained hidden from them. So the question would be why? And actually the Bible confirms it. It says, surely you are God, God who hides his face. It also says to seek the Lord when he can be found. Implying quite clearly if you have to seek him that he's not right there in front of your face. You're going to have to look for him. Also tells you to search for him with all your heart. I will be found of you when you search for me with all of your heart. So, let's assume for argument's sake that I'm telling the truth and there is a God and he's omnipotent and omnibenevolent and omniscient and he does want to enter in relationship with you. Why has he not made himself more obviously known? Well, I can think of five really good answers, but for the purposes of this video, I'll just focus on one. Now keep in mind, whenever I speculate about the nature of God, I'm speculating theologically. This is an educated guess. Obviously, I don't know for a fact why God would remain hidden, but I can give you one potentially very, very good answer. I myself is a, am a Christian. I live my life to the best of my ability as if God were 100% real. Now, I've said to people often, he's 100% real to me. But the important thing is I live my life that way. I read the scriptures in the Bible and I read the injunctions in the Bible and I take them very, very seriously as the words of the actual living God. So in other words, when the Bible says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, I do. When the Bible has commands about how to live your life, I try to practice them to the best of my ability. When the Bible says to lay your life down on the, on the altar, Offer up your life as a living sacrifice. It's telling you, me the Christian, to make your life about serving God to the utmost, to the best of your ability. And I actually live my life that way. And there's a lot of other Christians that you may know on Twitter and in real life who actually do too. Here's the kicker. I do it voluntarily. I do it voluntarily and out of love. I'm 100% convinced that the God of the Bible is real. And I'm 100% convinced that he speaks to me through the scriptures and he is telling me to do things. And I do them to the best of my ability, but I do it voluntarily and I do it out of love. Now, let's assume for argument's sake that I'm 100% correct. Then that God of the Bible would be omnipotent as the Bible describes him, which means he could pr prove himself to you just like that. Poof. Poof. And you'd have no more questions. Herein lies the problem. He could, he could snap his fingers. Your house falls apart. He could go, look, down the street. That house is about to be set on fire. Sets the house on fire. You go, ah! I'm sorry I doubted you. I'm sorry I doubted you. And you'd start serving him just like I did. You'd live just the way the Christians that, that you know live. The real Christians. Here's the problem. You do it out of fear. You do it out of fear. If God were to show himself... Let's assume that the Bible is 100% correct, just for argument's sake. That God is sovereign, as he is described in the Bible perhaps 100 times. This is what the sovereign Lord says. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. All authority on heaven and earth has been handed over to me. That means that God could, with the snap of his fingers, destroy your house. Or with the snap of his fingers, totally revitalize your life. Give you everything you ever wanted. That's what the Bible says. All authority in heaven and earth has been handed over to me, which means he's the final say over everything that happens in the world. That's a lot of power. 
That's a lot of unbelievable power. That's omnipotence. It's almighty. So let's just assume that he is actually almighty. Now, in my particular case, I have no doubts about the sovereignty of God. And you will probably take this with a grain of salt, but I believe personally that he has revealed to me his sovereign power time and time and time again. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that God is sovereign. You don't know it. And he's never proved it to you and he's never shown it to you. Why? Why? Three o'clock in the morning, he goes, wake up. You go, what? That house down the street, I'm going to set it on fire. Poof, sets it on fire. Ah! That's exactly what you do. You'd serve him, you live just the way I did. You, you would start living immediately, that day, that minute, just like I live. But here's the kicker, you'd do it out of fear. And you wouldn't love him one bit. You'd hate him. You'd resent him. You'd resent him. Yeah, you'd serve God for sure. I promise you he would. If he demonstrated himself as 100% sovereign, yeah, absolutely you would serve him. No ifs, ands, or buts. You'd serve him exactly the way you're told to in Philippians. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's exactly what you do, but you wouldn't do it voluntarily for one minute. You'd do it completely out of fear, and you would hate his guts. The way that God operates is he hints, whispers, gives you a hint. Yes, I am actually almighty. Psst, psst. Yes, I actually am. If you want him to prove it to you, you got to ask him humbly to prove it to you. Then search for him with all your heart. I'm telling you the truth. He proved it to me conclusively, to my own intellectual, emotional, spiritual satisfaction that he is in fact sovereign, period. No ifs, ands, or buts. I've seen it demonstrated to my satisfaction 50, 100, maybe a thousand times. Maybe a thousand times, maybe twice a week. But I've sought him for that and I've asked him to do it. If he just showed up and said, don't argue. And you said, why not? And he said, poof, there goes your house. Yeah, you'd start serving exactly the way the Bible was, except you wouldn't love him at all. At all. And you'd resent every minute of the service. Now, Matt Dillahunty has argued to the contrary, said that, you know, apparently, the, the, theologically speaking, Satan knows who God is and knows what God is capable of, and yet still chooses not to serve him. Satan's not a human. So that's a really big difference, theologically speaking. Christopher Hitchens has talked, to, talked about God as he's a celestial tyrant. If he was in fact a celestial tyrant, Christopher Hitchens wouldn't run his mouth off. Why? He'd be terrified to do it. Actual tyrants don't get disrespected by anybody. Why? Because people are terrified of them. If you actually knew and you actually experienced for one minute just how sovereign and powerful God word was, in fact, you'd be terrified. Yeah, you'd serve him. But you'd hate him. And it's not exactly the type of relationship that God is trying to build with people. He wants to hint at his existence. He wants to give you little, little, little whispers, little nudges. Yeah, I actually do exist. So you start following him on your own. You start pursuing him on your own. And you somehow come to the conclusion in your heart that he is worth your sacrifice. That he is worth your giving of your life to. That it's the right thing to do. And you do it voluntarily. See, Satan is wired differently than a human being. If you sat in the inner circle of Hitler while he was giving orders, there was not a single solitary person who ever said anything to him to his face. Why? Because they were terrified too. Because they'd be killed. God is not a celestial tyrant, nor does he want to be a celestial tyrant. If he were, Christopher Hitchens would, wouldn't have run his mouth off so freely. Nobody would. Nobody would disrespect a celestial tyrant. And he'd show up with power and authority like that every single minute and keep you cowering before him. That's not the type of relationship God wants. That's part, part of why he keeps himself hidden from you. Because he wants to build a relationship of trust. And he calls it faith. Where you hear a few of his words and you get enough of it in your heart. And you go, you know, that kind of does seem true. That kind of actually does seem true. 
What if that is actually true? I'm going to look deeper into that from the point of view of maybe, maybe he does exist, and maybe if he does exist, he might actually be as purely good as he is rumored to be. So maybe it would be in my best interest to give up my life and sacrifice my life to, to serving him. But that's something you have to come to to yourself voluntarily without coercion. It's ironic. You know, a lot of you don't know this because a lot of the, a lot of the atheists who I talked to were raised fundamentalists. And, you know, those people might have meant well, but their whole game was coercion. That's all they were about. Coercing you into being a better Christian because you were afraid of going to hell. That's not really what it's about. At all. It's not the type of relationship God is trying to build with you. At all. It's not one of fear. And ultimately, yeah, it's one of fear after you have come to know and love and serve. If you were raised in a toxic fundamentalist tradition, they, they were all about coercion. That's all they were about. Trying to get you to be a better Christian, trying to don't do this and don't do that and don't do this and don't do that because you're afraid that if you do, you're going to go to hell. First of all, that's no way to live. And I promise you that's not how I live <laughs> at all. Not even a little. Not even a tiny little bit. So that's just one potential answer for the hiddenness of God. God is remaining hidden on purpose because he wants you to seek him and he wants you to find him and he wants it to be a choice in your heart and he doesn't want to coerce you. Amen.